Good evening. The Jackson Public School Board meeting is now called to order. Board members, we have all members present and therefore we have a quorum. We've all had an opportunity to review the agenda. Is there a motion to adopt the agenda as presented? So moved. Second. Dr. Luckett has moved. Mr. Figures has seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any nays? There being none, the motion is approved. And that was quick and easy, and we're already to the superintendent's report. Dr. Green. Awesome. So uh, good evening to everyone. Um, President Johnson, board members, all of our JPS administrators and team members, to our staff members, uh, parents and scholars who are joining us virtually. Um, we will begin as we typically do with a video presentation um, of the latest district news from our ITV team. Take it away, team. You are invited to celebrate with us as we celebrate our 2020 graduates. JPS is showcasing virtual graduations for the class of 2020. The presentation of the class of 2020 and the awarding of diplomas for all seven high schools took place at Mississippi Veterans Memorial Stadium. You can view the ceremonies at our website on JPS ITV Comcast Channel 19 and online on our Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter platforms. Congratulations, 2020 graduates. As part of our ongoing online celebration of the class of 2020, we are also honoring the top 20 scholars of each of our seven high schools. Please visit our website to view photos and to read more about these outstanding scholars. Congratulations to all of our seniors. Thank you, Jackson Public Schools nurses, for your support during the COVID-19 pandemic. As a component of the Office of Climate and Wellness, the district's five-member nursing corps would usually be engaged in the operations of our school-based health clinics. However, in the weeks since statewide closures of schools due to COVID-19, they have adapted their duties to meet new conditions. Before screening the more than 1,500 graduating seniors and the adults they would encounter during a week of commencement activities, the nurses administered the same checks during our food distribution programs. They also provided temperature checks and screenings for the presence of coronavirus-related symptoms in our child nutrition, campus enforcement, and facilities staff. Thank you, JPS nursing staff, for all you do to keep us safe and healthy. Congratulations to recent JPS graduate Charles Rounds III. Rounds is the $6,000 grand prize winner of the Lowell Milken Center for Unsung Heroes 2020 Artifact Award. He was recognized for his watercolor artwork and collage highlighting World War II unsung hero Dr. Eugene Lazowski. The surprise announcement was made by the Milken Center representatives via virtual presentation. Milken Center representative surprised Rounds and his mom, Tanya Rounds, with the news during a virtual presentation. Rounds is a recent JPS graduate. To view his award-winning work, please visit LowellMilkenCenter.org. Two JPS scholars are winners of the Walter Anderson Museum of Art Annual Scholarship Exhibition Award. The grand prize winner and recipient of $1,000 scholarship is Amari Funches. Amari was recognized for her art, The Water of Life Mixed Media. The second place winner and recipient of $500 scholarship is Desmond Young. Desmond was honored for his work, Life More Abundant, Life More Free Mixed Media. Both Amari and Desmond are Power APAC scholars. To see their art and to read more about these talented scholars, please visit wamascholarshipshow.myportfolio.com. Casey Elementary Scholars won second place in the Spring 2020 Mississippi Stock Market Gang. The winners are Paige Barker, London Bennett, Dylan Crockett, and Marshall Smith. In the simulated stock trading competition, Casey outperformed the S&P 500 by nearly 17%. Their coach was Rosalind Thomas McCreary. A huge congratulations to our winners. 
The JPS Child Nutrition Department will be offering its summer food service program from June 1st through July 10th. We will be closed July 1st through 7th in observation of the district-wide observance of the July 4th holiday. Grab-and-go breakfast and lunch meals will be served from 11.30 a.m. until 1 p.m. Monday through Friday. Please visit our website at www.jackson.k12.ms.us for the listed locations of service. Children must be 18 years old or younger to participate. Jackson Public Schools appoints two new executive administrators to the positions of Chief Operations Officer and Chief Academic Officer. Dr. Jose Salgado is JPS's new Chief Academic Officer, and Mr. William Joseph Albright is the district's new appointed Chief Operations Officer. Dr. Jose Salgado is a distinguished educator with a superior background in leadership. He served most recently as the Chief Academic Officer of the Schenectady City School District in New York. Dr. Salgado holds a Doctor of Education degree from Harvard University in Cambridge and a Master's of Education from Boston University and a Bachelor of Agricultural Engineering. As JPS CAO, Dr. Salgado will oversee the Offices of Teaching and Learning and the Department of Exceptional Education. Joseph William Albright is the district's new Chief Operations Officer. Mr. Albright is a strategic leader with management executive experience and deep-rooted military background. Before coming to JPS, he served nearly eight years as the Vice President for Technical Services at Sodexo Incorporated, North America School Segment. Albright holds a Master of Science in Industrial Engineering from the University of Tennessee, a Master's of Strategic Studies from the U.S. Army War College, and a Bachelor of Mechanical Engineering from the University of Dayton. As COO, Albright will lead the district's facilities in operation, child nutrition, property accounting, campus enforcement, information technology, and transportation departments. Welcome to our new administrators. Would you like to become a team member of Team JPS? The JPS Office of Human Resources will be hosting a virtual hiring chat this Thursday, June 4th from 6.30 till 8 p.m. Please visit our website to learn how you can join the virtual chat and become a member of Team JPS. For more information about Jackson Public Schools, please visit our website, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and stay informed about the district's coronavirus response by visiting jackson.k12.ms.us forward slash coronavirus response. As always, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Cormack, our public engagement team, and specifically the ITTV team for uh, developing those uh, that highlights real. It's really important that we keep in front of us all, uh, all the amazing things that are happening throughout our district. Um, board members, as we do each month, um, we would like to use this time to provide some updates to you regarding our progress surrounding the bond program. Um, we're continuing to um, move bond projects along um, and to uh, complete those projects with quality. And so uh, at this time, I'll invite Doc, uh, Mr. Don McCracken, uh, our Executive Director of Facilities and Operations, to join us to provide some additional updates. Mr. McCracken. Uh, thank you, Dr. Green. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Green. Uh, to board president, to the uh, board members and Dr. Green. Uh, we come to you again each month to bring you updates as to where we are with the bond program. We have five points that we'd like to share with you uh, today. And the first being the status of the selection of the professionals, uh, the staff vendors uh, participation, uh, MDE cap update, uh, projects, uh, major projects on the construction, line items on the construction and samples of uh, projects. Starting with the very first one, this is the design team. We uh, have uh, submitted all the executive summaries. Uh, they have been completed uh, for your perusal for next month, excuse me, next, next board meeting. Uh, so those contracts are being uh, reviewed for approval and we will submit those at the next board meeting. 
Next slide. I uh, shared with you staff and vendors participation, uh, our staff and small vendors uh, throughout the communities. Uh, we have completed right at 30 projects under $50,000. We have more projects that are certainly uh, going on, but as of now, we've completed 30 projects under $50,000 with our staff and small vendors. And these are some of the samples of some of the work that we've done and some of the work that the small uh, businesses have done. Uh, successfully and also ongoing. Next slide. Uh, we have uh, been communicating with you on several occasions about MDE and the CAP program corrective action plan. Uh, we have uh, six schools remaining, uh, Boyd being one, Van Winkle being the other. We've completed work at Van Winkle. Uh, below each school are the line items or the deficiencies that MDE shared with us, and we are in the process of completing those. The bond program actually was uh, geared to assist with completing the bond program, and we are implementing that uh, as we speak. Uh, with Van Winkle, since it has been completed, we've made a request through Dr. Green to invite MDE to come out and check that school off, uh, which will leave us uh, with, I think, five schools. Uh, and as time progresses and as well as the bond progresses, we will uh, completely remove all of the schools uh, from, uh, from that list. The next slide. This is a continuation of uh, a school that's associated with the bond program, excuse me, with, with the MDE CAP program and also the items that are deemed deficient and we're in the process of getting those corrected. Next. Callaway and Forest Hill. Callaway being one of the largest uh, construction projects as well as Forest Hill. All of these items that you see, Callaway as well as Forest Hill will be completed uh, in this bond program. Uh, projects have already been bidded and we're in the process of awarding Callaway. Forest Hill is un underway. Next slide. Jim Hill. Uh, is another school, uh, damaged bleachers. We've already awarded the contracts. We're just in the process of moving, removing those damaged bleachers and hopefully can invite uh, MDE out to uh, sign off on that school. Uh, we're in the process of replacing those bleachers. So it is our hope that they will uh, work with us in that regard. Wingfield, uh, these are the items that have been uh, dubbed as deficiencies and we are in the process of correcting those as well. Next slide. Now this, these remaining slides are projects, this is, was considered major projects under construction and the location of these projects and when some of the work has started and what's going to take place this summer, uh, starting actually the spring through the summer. Uh, we have a vast majority of projects that we would like to start and have started uh, in this particular case with the elementary schools, we have 17 locations that will receive construction work uh, this summer. And as you see uh, with Van Winkle, some work had already started. Uh, it is pretty much completed now. Uh, Wilkins has already started and the others will show that work will begin in June. Next slide. Continuation of projects that are scheduled to start and or have started. Uh, these are the various locations and you can note and see that MDE, uh, the CAP projects will be a part of that as well in terms of getting those completed. Next slide. Continuation at the various locations. So there's 17 sites uh, that have major projects that are under construction. The next grouping of projects are your line item projects. Next slide, please. Your line item projects that are under construction. And these, uh, these also are schools where work has already begun and are, will start in June. Mr. McCracken, would you please explain line item projects? Line item projects, for example, um, uh, with Bates, we're doing some painting this summer. That's a part of the line item. Uh, at Jim, John Hopkins, you will probably see where we're doing the walkway the driveway improvements 
that work has already gotten started. Uh, and it, again, it's just one or two projects that are associated with the bond program that are not packaged in a large grouping. These are smaller projects. Next slide, please. This is a continuation of all the projects that are scheduled at the various schools. Uh, next slide. And again, continuation. So that is a total of 35 projects, or excuse me, 35 locations where work will be going on or has already started at the various schools. So that's a lot of work uh, and we're excited about it. I'm sure the community will be excited. Uh, we're looking forward to getting uh, a majority of this work completed this summer, especially the line item projects. The larger projects will go on uh, for the next two, uh, three, and possibly six months. Some projects have a larger project, they have 200 days for completion. Uh, I think the, the second largest, excuse me, first largest, right, uh, a year uh, for work to be completed. Uh, so we're excited about the work uh, that has already started and looking forward to the work uh, to be continued. Next slide. This is an example of a line item project. Um, Chestain, we showed this to you previously where the portico was damaged. It has been replaced uh, and we're moving to other line item projects. We can move these projects very quickly versus putting them in a large package. Sometimes it takes a little longer to do in order to uh, uh, move them but there, there are pros and cons. We can get better prices or we can move them swiftly. Uh, we chose to move them swiftly because of the timeline. In addition to getting uh, better prices, we are negotiating with contractors and doing value engineering, which certainly helps us to uh, reduce uh, some of the cost uh, that the contractor may put into the price that would not uh, destroy the integrity of the work. So again, this is work that is uh, completed and we will continue with uh, work being done at um, Chestain. Next slide. This is Forest Hill. Uh, we've already started with the restroom renovations. Uh, in the building, you've, you've seen pictures of work that has already gotten started uh, in the Coliseum. This is where we are now to replace and repair other restrooms in Forest Hill. So that work is ongoing, uh, not as we speak, I think they got off at, at three, but it will start back up first thing tomorrow morning. And we're excited about the work uh, that's going on. The principals are excited and we're trying to work with all principals. There may be some questions about activities, but we're working with the principals to ensure that they will be informed of all the activities, the locations, and also what uh, is required and what is expected. Okay, next slide. Uh, this is a, again a line item at uh, John, Ho John Hopkins. Uh, we performed an apron, concrete apron for the entrance at John Hopkins and the county uh, communicated with Mrs. Delman Boyd, which is now the um, public works director with Hines County and they are scheduling uh, to do the remaining work, which is the asphalt starting with the concrete uh, ends and they will do the uh, asphalt uh, from uh, from one end to the next. And that concludes my presentation. Are there any questions? I've got one, um, yes. Mr. McCracken. Um, the restrooms in Forest Hill, will they be done um, for the new school year? What we've done, we've staggered the construction where we will always have a set or two sets of restrooms that will be in use. Uh, we, once one is completed, we'll go to the next one, similar to what we were doing when we did the work at uh, Wingfield. We never had units, uh, restrooms not available for students. We always provided um, restrooms uh, for their use. But to answer the oh, question yes. more directly, it's they will not be complete. No, not all, all of them. No, the, the entire restrooms would not be complete. We would stagger the construction to complete one set, then go to the next set and complete it, then go to the next set. Okay. Thank you. Did that answer your question? 
It did. Okay. Thank you. Are there uh, any other questions? Yeah, I have. Uh, and I may have just forgotten it. Did we do some uh, bathroom work at Jim Hill? Uh, no, sir. We are in the process of doing some work at Jim Hill. We've already awarded a contract and we're in the process of doing um, issuing a notice to proceed at Jim Hill. As a matter of fact, the, war, the project has been awarded. We're now getting a contract uh, prepared uh, to issue a notice to proceed. All right. But Mr. McCracken, there, there is some uh, arrest room um, work included in that package, correct? That is correct. I think uh, Mr. Figures, you might be remembering some of the photos that we had, I believe it was at Wingfield. Wingfield. Um, really beautiful uh, renovative renovation work that happened there. Are there any other questions? Mr. McCracken, it's Robbie Luckett. I'm just wondering where yes, we are in our overall timeline. Um, I know we had some inevitable delays due to the coronavirus and just would like to get just a general update. It's thanks for all of this information, but where are we in, in, our, in our progress towards getting through the bond? My estimate uh, at this juncture, we're right at, right at halfway of the bond program, uh, but we've completed right at 45% um, percent of the work. Uh, we still have quite a bit of work to do. Uh, fortunately, the dollar amount uh, will be heightened because of the larger projects that we have already uh, awarded, and we did those first. So that's when you will start seeing a lot of funds uh, being uh, encumbered. But in terms of the, the status of the overall project, I would say right at 45 uh, maybe 45 percent, but we will give you accurate numbers once we uh, all the projects have been awarded um, that are presently that have not been assigned yet. Contracts have not been signed. And Mr. McCracken, I think you were re uh, referencing this. Would you just uh, let board members know the information that you're working on that you're compiling uh, to share with them? Um, yes, absolutely. What we're compiling now is a list of all contracts that have been approved. Um, and we're also showing the location of those contractors, uh, the, if they're minority or uh, majority firms, and also attaching the dollar amount that's associated with them. We were, uh, one, we were about to present that in the last um, presentation to show the dollar amount, but some of the projects have not been awarded. So we opted not to present that at that time. But this is where we would like to present you all of the financing that we have at this juncture. We've we'll been working with Mrs. Miller and also the uh, interior auditor, uh, internal audit, auditor, uh, to make sure that we're staying within the confines of the budgets as well as the uh, listing of projects. We are uh, putting that together. Uh, some projects, some contracts have not been endorsed as of yet. Uh, but we still can possibly just give you what was bidded until uh, until that time we will uh, give you what we have. Okay. And any, que any other questions for uh, Mr. McCracken? And we're, we're keeping a record of every dime that has been expended and every project that has been that is either under construction or that is completed. And that will be uh, presented uh, at a later date so that that will be uh, presented to the public as well. Okay. Thank you, Mr. McCracken. Thank you for your time. I'm excited. I want to see all, we will, I would like to see this be an ex exceptional success for the entire district. And uh, we're looking forward to continue. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Madam President, board members, um, uh, as I pre prepare to conclude my uh, report this evening, I drafted a statement that I'd like to read uh, to you and, and to our community. The statement is dated June the 2nd, 2020. Dear Jackson Public Schools community, I'm compelled to express my heartfelt grief and sadness in the wake of the senseless deaths 
of Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, and George Floyd. I join the millions of people around the world who seek answers to these lives lost and who so desperately need to know that their deaths won't be in, in vain. The sad reality of their deaths is compounded by this awful COVID-19 pandemic and the frustration of having to experience these multiple traumas all at once. Like many of you, I'm sure, I've spent the last few weeks, years really, reflecting on the senselessness and callousness that led to these deaths and of the promise and potential of these lives cut short. I've also reflected on my own privilege as someone who's earned a college education and advanced in my career. Even as a black man living in America, I know that my socioeconomic status affords me a degree of increased insulation from the daily affronts that many black people experience in this country. Even still, I found myself whistling Vivaldi this past weekend while out running in my neighborhood. As Claude Steele, describe, as Claude Steele describes in this powerful text, I found myself actively working to make myself less menacing or threatening to those I passed along the way. I don't share this experience in search of any sympathy, but to acknowledge that although I've accomplished and achieved a bit of that American dream, I know that my skin color is often experienced as a liability. And even I struggle to overcome this from time to time. Like many of you, I've seen the news reports and read the articles and consumed quite a bit of the social media posts that seem to throw salt on the wounds of racial and social inequalities in our country. I've engaged in conversations with brothers and sisters of various racial, ethnic, and social backgrounds and found us all to be searching for the key to greater understanding and harmony across differences. I've been encouraged by those who have lifted their voices in solidarity and calling for justice and peace as I've celebrated others and their actions to fight against injustice. I've challenged myself to determine how I might make a greater contribution. What occurs to me is that I have an awesome opportunity and responsibility as the superintendent of Jackson Public Schools to protect and prepare our scholars to create the world that we all long for. I think about our strategic plan and specifically our profile of a JPS graduate. Far beyond the mathematical and literacy skills and much more than the knowledge of social studies, the sciences and the arts, we have pledged to prepare our scholars to change the world with critical thinking skills communication skills, and a global mindedness that broadens their horizons and provides a much deeper well from which to draw for the challenges they'll face. The profile is particularly important to me as an educator because it provides a clearer sense of what we're working toward, and it isn't to simply maintain the status quo. Our charge is to ensure that the scholars who are called to create a more just society are well prepared to do so. I do not consider myself an activist. However, I do believe that none of us has the luxury of sitting on the sidelines when it comes to fighting against oppression and systemic racism. To quote Angela Davis, in a racist society, it is not enough to be non-racist. We must be anti-racist. And let's be absolutely clear. We've seen far too many examples in this country of that lethal mix of prejudice and power to know that racism is very much so alive today. My goal in making these statements is not to incite or divide, but to simply name today's condition and to invite each of us, all of us together, to work towards the tomorrow that I know we can achieve. 
As I redouble my commitment to the scholars and families in Jackson, my call to action is for each and every educator in this district, for our parents and for our partners to join me in preparing the next generation of leaders and co-conspirators. One of our core values is relevance, and it challenges us all to learn to connect with each other, the larger community, and the 21st century world, ultimately developing agency to contribute to positive uh, change here in Jackson, in Mississippi, and throughout the world. In the memories of those lives lost this month and of the enduring legacy of Black Mississippians that have gone before, we will work to ensure that they do not and did not die in vain. Far beyond our goals of improving academics and behavior, we have the moral imperative to stretch and mold young minds to become righteous leaders leaders who will blaze a new pathway forward for this nation and our world, leaders who live up to all of the promise and potential that lies within them. Thank you. Madam President, this ends my remarks this evening. I turn so the I, over to you. Since we are online, I guess I'm the only person that can um, audibly Clap. Thank you, um, Dr. Green, for your very, very thoughtful words and for reminding us that we all have a role to play and how important it is that um, we aim high and not just to the standard of a standard education, but to make the world a better place. Board members, are there any comments? I'm sure there are. Outstanding job, Dr. Green outstanding. Uh, as you were talking, I couldn't help but remember, go back to a program that Robbie uh, was over just recently regarding the situation at Jackson State, which was an outstanding program. Uh, I agree with everything that you said regarding this. It's, these are the times that try me in soul. Thank you so very much. Madam Chair, I'd like to offer, make a recommendation and perhaps a motion that uh, Dr. Green's uh, statement be entered into the permanent minutes of the Jackson Public School Board meeting. Seconded. Is there a second? Yes. It has been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any nays? There being none, Dr. Green's statement shall be put into the record. I would like to also suggest, Dr. Green, that you uh, send that statement to the print media. I think it deserves being shared. Can't tell you what to do with your statement, but I just think that it should. Yes, ma'am. I receive that. <laughs> we, we do intend to share it for free. Thank you. Any other comments, board members? We'll just echo what everyone else has said. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Green, for those words necessary in this moment and this time. Um, I know that the board supports you wholeheartedly in those sentiments, and uh, I'm, I'm glad that you will share them, and I hope that the entire JPS community will have an opportunity to receive them. Yeah, i just also say thank you, and um, just for the powerful statement and reminder of how lucky we are to be parents of children in this district. All right. Um, do we have any participants for public comment? Oh, man, we do not. 
Thank you, Ms. Williams. Um, community members who would like to make a public comment should email their request to roswilliams at jackson.k12.mississippi.us. I'm sorry, .ms.us. Um, no later than 5.15. Um, or they can log into the Zoom meeting between 5 and 5.15 to indicate their desires. Board members, we now are at information items only. Um, Mr. Johnson. Good evening, board president, superintendent, and members of the board. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, I present to you a recommendation to renew our contract agreement with Canon Solutions of America Incorporated to replace copier machines at all, all schools and district offices with new and more efficient equipment. Uh, we use the state of Mississippi contract process. All equipment on the state contract uh, were vetted and negotiated by the Department of Finance Administration and are cleared by the state of Mississippi. Uh, we did negotiate additional terms outside of the state contract to benefit the district. Uh, that includes no charges for moving copiers from one location to another and uh, 1,500 proximity cards. Four members, are there any questions? Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Thank you. And now I'm um, Dr. Merritt. Yes, ma'am, great evening, uh, President Johnson and school board members and Dr. Green. Uh, the administration recommends uh, for review the Canaan uh, Homeless Information Management System for our McKenzie Vento students, and those are our students who are uh, identified as homeless. The purpose of this program is to help us uh, really identify and uh, identify the resources that we give these students upon enrollment. Uh, we will be able to track not only needs in terms of uniforms, but uh, if they're in a shelter, uh, if they have transportation and things of that nature. And so a lot of these students are very mobile. And so this is something that's being done by telephone by our um, McKinney Vento coordinator or liaison. And so what this program will allow us to do is to electronically transfer this information upon uh, the student being enrolled at a specific school. So uh, again, this is a way for us to step into the 21st century and being very knowledgeable and aware of the supports that our students may, uh, need so we can be more responsive to them. And uh, it will not allow a gap in services. Um, board members, any questions? Um, I had, I did have a question, Ms. Johnson. Um, Dr. Merritt, thanks for the thorough responses to the board questions in the packet. Um, I was just wondering if you could share with the public all, some of the work that has been done to keep in touch with um, our homeless students, uh, especially as we've been closed over the last quarter. So, yes, sir. Um, some of the work that's been being done uh, Dr. Strong, who serves as our homeless liaison, she has been working with the shelters and has uh, gone to provide support to individual students um, based on their needs. We have continued to give out uniforms and ensure that they have, uh, they have uh, had the packets and things of that nature to make sure that they are still receiving the instructional support and resources uh, that are needed. Uh, we truly operate by uh, our core value of equity, so we want to make sure that we are giving, paying special attention to this group of students to make sure that they have everything that they need in light of the current situation. That's great. Um, and I, I was especially um, impressed with just the um, contact that continued with shelters and with the, the, the caregivers and parents of, of our students, even with the, their, our schools closed down due to COVID-19. So again, thanks for that, that update. Certainly, I, thank you. i just like to also uh, echo what Dr. Tuzak said, Dr. Merritt, because I remember when you 
first brought the staffing uh, to the board, I, I questioned uh, how uh, much could get done, but I'm very impressed with the work that you and your team have uh, been doing to make sure that all of our students are receiving the services they need, particularly during this time of pandemic. So I just wanted to let you know Good job. <laughs> Thank you. And I do want to give kudos to Dr. Strong because she is doing an awesome job mm -hmm. with the program and with her leadership with this and really um, rebranding this program as our MVP program instead yeah. of our homeless program. So, right. It, it, uh, it really comes through. It really comes through. I appreciate that. Be sure to give her our best. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you all. I'd echo that as well, Dr. Merritt. And um, as it has it, it has pertained to our work with partners in education and the special um, kind of committee that was established. If you think there are resources that members of the board can bring to bear to help in, the, in these regards, we're happy to try and play that role. Do what yes, we can. Sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, Dr. Merritt, could you tell me about how many students are um, benefit from this work? Yes, ma'am. Currently, we have 3,124. That is that is the number of students that we ended the program with this uh, school year. That's amazing. Yes, ma'am. Um, thank you. Board members, are there any comments or questions? Thank you, Dr. Merritt. Thank you all. Um, Dr. Bingham Gibbs? Oh, we can't hear you. I still can't hear you. <laughs> um, do we? Is it possible for you just to call in, maybe? I'll furnish um, the call-in number if it's the board's pleasure to move forward, and then we can come back potentially to this information item. That is, is that fine, board members? All right, so that leads to um, Dr. Cormack. And now let me unmute. <laughs> Good evening uh, to Board President Johnson, Dr. Green, members of the board. Uh, I come before you this evening uh, to present uh, for information um, the uh, revised job description for our district interpreter. Um, we are asking and seeking the, the board's um, input and, and um, action tonight um, or information to um, actually approve the um, revision of this job description, which would allow um, for a Spanish interpreter to be located in the Office of Enrollment Student Services. Um, given the growing uh, Spanish speaking population in our Jackson uh, metro area, we think that it's vital to have um, a Spanish interpreter located at this first uh, entry point for many families in the district as they enroll um, their students in the district. Um, last year, the board approved the district interpreter role, um, but it did not include um, this uh, location and the ability uh, as a record specialist. And so we're seeking this revision to reflect um, our um, idea that uh, it would be a great location um, as a first uh, entry point for families in the district. Additionally, um, that or original proposal uh, listed this employee and uh, this particular job as a uh, hourly rate, and we are seeking a salaried position on under the existed administrative salary schedule, which would um, put it on the interpreter C line. So um, we are hopeful for your support uh, for this action. Thank you, Dr. Cormack. Um, can you tell me how many students would be affected by this position, by the person in this position? So um, our, um, our number of, of Spanish-speaking families, uh, it's hard to put an exact number. Um, 
we will have a better read because there's a, a there are a number of families that speak English and uh, speak a second language in the home currently 10 primary languages but um, they may not require services um, and often students will interpret so um, I will I can uh, investigate the precise amount of English learners in the district and and return to the board with that information approximately 10 languages spoken Spanish are predominant language um, and can pull that together that figure together but Dr. Cormack, it's approximately 341 EL students that we have, majority of those who speak Spanish. Appreciate that, Dr. Merritt. Teamwork. Thank you. <laughs> there it is. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Board members, are there any questions or comments? Thank you, Dr. Cormack. Um, is Dr. Bingham Gibbs on now? I believe I am. Can you hear me now? Oh, yes, we can hear you. <laughs> Thank you. Let's try this again. Um, good evening, board president, board members, Dr. Green. The Office of Exceptional Education Services is presenting um, to you tonight for a review of a renewal service agreement with scientific learning um, to provide a reading and language arts intervention services for students with this or for students with disabilities in Jackson Public School District. This program, um, it will help to close the achievement gaps and to meet our literacy and language and learning needs for our students with disabilities. Um, thank you for the additional data that you um, also included in your presentation. Uh, board members, are there any questions or comments? I do have, um a question, Dr. Bingham Gibbs, regarding the um, the way that the students were assigned, the protocols to which they were assigned, and do we have some procedures in place to be sure that we don't have to play catch up? I guess it's kind of how it worked when we they were signed a um, five day protocol, whereas it was later on determined that three day might have been more appropriate. Am I understanding that correctly? It, kind, kind of. What happens? Kind of, sort the, of. Yeah, yeah. What happens is that the program, the um, the company recommends five days a week. However, due to um, with scheduling and they might only see their exceptional ed teacher three days a week, that's where some of the protocols had to be adjusted. Uh, we couldn't remove them as much as we, you know, as the five days due to them missing out of other instruction. So that's why we readjusted the protocol to three days a week um, for those students that were on that original five day a week protocol. And you anticipate that that will, um, we're going to continue this, correct? Yes. yes, we are going to continue the three day a week protocol. However, if a school, um, we also leave it um, the autonomy to the principal if they're able to get on the program five days a week like the um we would definitely um welcome them to use it for five days a week however we do understand the other requirements that some of our students must meet as well so that's why they're allowed to do three day a week um okay. Protocol also okay great thank you for that appreciate it. you're welcome um i have i have two questions one um I say, first of all, thank you for the data and the work that went into putting this presentation together. It was really thorough and um, I got a lot out of reviewing the, the presentation. Um, the first uh, question was one that um, was just simply, um, again, I know there are a lot of uh, decisions to be made about how we reopen the schools in the fall. And so I, I was wondering if you could share um, how we might be able to connect are we thinking about how we can connect students who need this service to the program if they're not in a building? Right. Um, well, we ha we have already Ms. Pearson, who is the lead um, of this program implementation. She has attended a um, virtual training session with Fast Forward. Uh, she actually did that last about two weeks ago. So she's starting the training process as well as um, Fast Forward is designing a plan so that we can use our paraprofessionals um, to address the need of our students when they're at home, when the teacher might be handling instruction with the whole class. 
So we, we are working on plans to address those needs. It will also go into effect, you know, as the district, if we are, um, we're working hard as a district to provide our students with devices and hotspots. So if we are able to provide them with one-on-one -on -one, um, devices and hotspots, then that'll definitely help with um, being able to reach the students at home or in a virtual platform. Okay, that's really helpful. Um, the other question I have was actually triggered um, by some of the responses. Um, so in particular, uh, the question, um, I asked a question around, um, what factors affected attendance and participation? And some issues that were flagged were older machines or slower bandwidth or headphones that weren't working. Do we have a list of the places where those issues were identified and will we, since those are equipment related issues and can we have those issues fixed by the opening of schools? And once again, the district initiative to, um, and I probably need to speak with Ms. Uh, Robinson, um, they are rolling out a plan for us to add, you know, to purchase new new laptops or desktops for our programs or our district schools um, because it is a district wide um, issue that we're having, as well as with, as far as the the headphones. My office is able to purchase those headphones, so Miss Pearson has been charged. She has a list of er schools that need those because we are at 23 elementary sites. Um, so we also gave like incentives. Um, when teachers had so many students reach a certain point, we would buy them headphones, you know, that type of thing. Um, they really worked hard to get those reading assistant headphones, but we do have a list of schools that we are going to purchase uh, with our federal dollars headphones for. Okay, great. Thank you. Board members, are there any other questions or comments? Um, Dr. Bing Gibbs, you can move on to the next. Okay, our next one is um, Mill Creek of Pearl. Um, let's see. The purpose of this agreement is to establish working procedures between Jackson Public School District and Mill Creek of Pearl in the provision of services to children eligible for special education in compliance with the federal and Mississippi state laws and regulations. Mill Creek of Pearl is a private facility recognized by the Mississippi Department of Education as, improved, as an approved educa educable child placement facility. Students are served at this facility are enrolled or referred by the school district placement. Board members, are there any questions or comments? Um, Dr. Bing Gibbs, if you could sort of explain to us why this contract is so important to our, our student outcomes. This one is our, what we have is we have a continuum of services in exceptional education, um, where we definitely, our um, least restrictive environment is where they're in the general education uh, with their peers, with, um, you know, just supports from the exceptional ed teacher. But we have some students that need more restrictive um, due to behavior or it, sometimes it's due to mental issues or uh, mental deficits that they might have. And these facilities are more equipped um, to work with the student and they work hard to provide them with behavior strategies and ways that they can um, transition back into their home setting. So we use these facilities. Um, we use Mill Creek of Pearl, CARES or Canopy, as well as Mill Creek of McGee to provide those services for our students that need that most restrictive environment to succeed and obviously board members it's it's the just to jump in there obviously it's a direct support to that dollar but it's also in in keeping in mind the needs of of all the scholars in the classroom as we we are better understanding of what the individual might need and meet those needs for them um it I, what it's providing the need, providing for the needs within the classroom or in a pullout or perhaps in an alternative placement is an opportunity for us to ensure that everyone gets what they need and, and have the environment that is most conducive for their learning. So um, across the board, it's, um, you know, it's, it's basically doing our job and, and giving young people what they require um, for their education needs. And, and overall, um, 
we are doing much better with meeting our scholars' needs um, in-house in JPS. At Mill Creek of Pearl, we have two students currently that are attending Mill Creek. So out of our 2,500 exceptional ed students, we have a few more that are at CARES and um, Mill Creek of Key, but at Mill Creek of Pearl, we only have two students that are, are um, at this location. Thank you. Can I just say one, I just wanna say one more thing. So uh, we're, we're constantly mindful of the placements and the process that we go through with the team and with the parents and, you know, um, all of those kind of weighing in as to what the needs are and how we can best meet those needs, whether it's internally within JPS and one of our schools or programs, um, or uh, one of the outside uh, placements. Um, I, I think we, we, we have to be careful not to celebrate the small numbers of scholars who are in alternative placements because it's going to be dependent upon their needs. And so if we happen to be in a place where there are many more scholars who simply require something that you know, we're unable to, to lift and provide with quality consistently, then we've got to consider that. Um, we might also consider recreating a program like that internally, but it's got to be something that we can do with quality consistently. Um, and, and, and because those needs kind of vary from year to year, depending on our enrollment and needs of those enrolled in our schools, um, we districts often will rely upon an outside placements uh, site. Thank you, Dr. Green. Um, sometimes we, um, we do the business of school very, very well. I just want us to also understand how it affects our students. Um, so thank you. And um, Dr. Bingham Gibbs, there is the last one. Okay. Item e. the, last, the last one we have is with Insights to Behavior. Um, this is a program that we use to store our behavior intervention plans, as well as it provides us with strategies um, and targeted behaviors to help us guide um, our uh, techniques with work, working with students with disabilities. Um, like I said, it is a place where we are housing our positive behavior support plans. Um, it keeps graphs and monitoring and tracking student progress for us. It also likes to identify the probable functions of behaviors based on the user's input and to give us suggestions of how to replace those behaviors and be proactive um, with strategies and implementation guidelines. Thank you. Um, board members, are there any questions or comments? There being none, thank you. I'm sorry, I was muted and didn't realize it. Um, now, Ms. Miller. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Ms. Johnson, Dr. Green, members of the board. Um, this item is being presented to you for information only for and only for inclusion in the board minutes. It is information regarding the emergency declaration at, that was declared at Forest Hill High School due to fire that broke out in the food concession area of the Coliseum back in March of 2019. We did have a fire in that area that damaged the concession room and subsequent damage was done to the um, gymnasium actually as the firefighters were there putting the fire out. And uh, due to the uh, it's nature of the incident and the fact that um, our students and staff were still on having to go to classes and on scene, uh, an emergency request was made by the executive director of facilities um, that was presented to at that point, at that time, um, Dr. Calvin Lockett, the op uh, deputy of operations and um, to move forward with the emergency uh, repair work to mitigate that damage uh, at Forest Hill High School. The um, executive director of facilities, the emergency declaration does allow for school districts if, if they have, or state entities actually, if they have certain um, instances that would um, have a direct impact on student and staff 
um, access as well as health and safety of the community to move forward without um, getting the going through the bid process. Um, the executive director of facilities didn't follow, didn't do bids, but in fact he did um, go out and get a dish, get multiple bids on the work, which is great, and um, was able to move forward with getting um, the services uh, performed at Forest Hill High School. We have, um, we also were able to file an insurance claim and the insurance company did advance the district $100,000 toward this, um, toward this fire and toward this service. So the district is now presenting to the board just for information again and also just to be spread on the minutes that the um, emergency declaration was declared at Forest Hill High School. A uh, purchase order was issued to PDT Logistics to perform the work. They did perform the work and the work has been um, perform satisfactory and has been paid. Um, we were board members a little, um, we're rusty with this uh, process, but we are working to develop um, more um, robust procedures internally. Hopefully this won't happen again. We won't have any emergencies, but in the, in the event that this does, we are working with Attorney Turner and um, with uh, Mr. McCracken, Ms. Robinson, and Mr. Albright when he comes on board in the event that this does occur again, that we will um, more, um, we'll be able to deal with this quickly and get it to the board um, more in a more timely fashion. Thank you, Ms. Miller. Board members, are there any questions or comments? Ms. Miller, um, can, do you have, so you mentioned um, developing more robust procedures to ensure um, that we don't end up back here again. Can you describe some of the actions that we'll take so that we can, um, we'll get this, this information more timely in the future? Sure, what um, we will need, what we will do is um, actually write out the steps. Um, there is a number of, there are a number of communications that must occur. Um, from the request to declare the emergency to the superintendent, the approval of that, uh, formally back to um, the whoever the department is, if it were my department, for example, and then to ensure that once the work has been completed, that we bring that to the board within um, 30 days or within 30 days of the tape that the payment has been made. That is what um, DFA envisions is how that process should work. And uh, we will make sure we tighten that up again. Um, I have not personally been a part of an emergency declaration for a number of years. Attorney Turner and I spent some time talking um, yesterday about it. And we think it was actually um, probably the last time it was brought forward to the board was probably doing, uh, during the 2008-2009, uh, maybe 2010 school year. So we will uh, make sure that we follow that process in the event that we do have an emergency uh, declaration that needs to be made. Thank you. Um, Attorney Turner, is there anything that you'd like to add? Not really. I, I have provided to Ms. Miller um, the back when um, I had been brought in on several of these, um, the paperwork that I would put together would encompass essentially the three steps that she set out. Um, either the, the district administrator, um, usually somebody who reports to Dr. Green, it could be, you know, whatever department oversees um, the situation or building where the emergency declares, that person writes a letter to the superintendent and it sets out, you know, fire has happened at Forest Hill, we need to get X prepared or repaired. I've contacted either one or several vendors and gotten quotes. I think it's going to cost this much. Will you um, declare an emergency so that we can move forward with fixing this? And so at the administrative level, usually the person who would report to Dr. Green, that person is the one that really does the legwork and the due diligence. And so he or she puts that together in a packet with all the attachments and the supporting documentation, and then it goes to Dr. Green. At that point, the second 
letter or document that I do a, a rough draft of is that there's a letter or a memo from Dr. Green, which says, I've received your request for the emergency declaration. You know, he can, if he, you know, if it's something like a fire or a tornado, it's kind of common sense. You don't necessarily need to call in attorneys or anybody else, but obviously if whatever, you know, Dr. Green deems is necessary for his own purposes, he would then decide whether or not he thinks the emergency actually needs to be declared. If he decides that that is appropriate, then there's, you know, like a three sentence memo that he does that says, you know, I'm declaring that this is an emergency situation and I'm authorizing you to move forward and take the steps that are necessary. That work is then done. And then once it's done and completed, there's a third letter that I've given Ms. Miller, um, a kind of a, 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 a template of, and it then is a memo from Dr. Green to the board members. And it says, you know, board members, this is the emergency that happened. I declared the emergency on such and such date. You know, all the backup documentation, including what the emergency consisted of and the supporting documentation showed what we spent, you know, who we paid it to, you know, or who all we paid it to. All of that is attached and all of that goes um, in the memo that then is presented to the board um, at the board meeting and all of that gets included in the minute. So I provided her kind of those shell documents that they'll be able to use that will set out that three-step process. So at that point, it really is, you know, just a matter of making sure that at the, the level of Dr. Green and particularly the folks below him, because Dr. Green, obviously, isn't going to be sitting up there monitoring all of that. It, it's kind of incumbent upon the folks that report to him to know that process, which is why the discussion that we had about a policy, you know, that says, you know, you have to take this to Dr. Green. Dr. Green needs to declare it formally. Once he declares it formally, you know, you go forward and do the work and then it needs to come to the board, the meeting at the board meeting after all of that is completed. So all of that is kind of set out in the, the document that I've, or documents that I've given them a template for. And with the policy, it should kind of set out the, the overarching um, process for how that happens. Thank you, Attorney Turner. Um, board members, are there any other questions or comments? Thank you, Ms. Miller. I have the next one. <laughs> oh, it is you. I have the next one. <laughs> Thank you, board members. Uh, the next item is the approval to award bid number 3124 to Socrates Garrett Enterprise of Jackson for the Forest Hill High School general improvements which are inclusive of repairs and renovations to the corridors in the building including floors, ceiling, paint and lighting, uh, classroom flooring, replacement of interior and exterior doors and hardware throughout and also cleaning uh, of the exterior. This is one of the 2018 bond issue projects and uh, we received five bids and Socrates Garrett Enterprises was the lowest bid meeting all uh, specifications and requirements. We are recommending to the board that this item be this um, bid item be approved and awarded to Socrates Garrett Enterprises. Thank you, Ms. Miller. Um, board members, are there any questions or comments? If not, is there a motion to approve action item um, information action item A? So moved. Second. Dr. Sivek has moved. Ms. Hilliard is seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Are there any nays? There being none, the motion is approved. Thank you, Ms. Miller. Now, board members, we are at the consent agenda items finance. All of the consent agenda items finance have been reviewed by the board previously, either brought before us as information only or in um, some other presentation. We've all had an opportunity to ask questions of the administration. Are there any further questions? No. If not, board members, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda items finance? So moved. Second. Dr. Luckett has moved. Ms. Hilliard has seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any nays? There being none, the motion is approved. 
Next, we have the consent agenda item general. All of the consent agenda items general have been presented to the board previously, and we've had an opportunity to ask questions of the administration. Are there any further questions? If not, board members, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda items general? So moved. Second. Dr. Harrison has um, moved, and Ms. Hilliard has seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Are there any nays? None. There being none, the motion is approved. Madam President, may, yes, I, ask, may I ask Dr. Green a quick question? Yes, ma'am. Dr. Green, uh, when is the anticipated start date for our new hires? Great question. Um, the official uh, for the for the next school year, um, their contract is uh, it begins July one. Uh, through the generous donation of um, our uh, partners and funders, uh, Kellogg Foundation, I've been able to secure on a limited um, contract, um, uh, uh, secure their time on a limited contract for the month of, of June. So both the CAO and COO are uh, working virtually, are, are on contract with us now. So they've already been involved in our planning for the reopening and um, for several other just uh, uh, issues and, and uh, bodies of work. So they're already working with us. Great, and they'll join board meetings sometime in the future. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, yes. Um, they, um, they're they already starting to weave into our, um, uh, some of our team meetings and uh, our planning, uh, as I said, the uh, advisory committee um, for school reopening, um, but yes, they'll, they'll, they will become a, um, you know, um, they will, they will be participating in the board meetings as right. well. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. Yes, ma'am. All right, board members, we have come to consent agenda items personnel. All of the consent agenda items personnel have been reviewed by board previously. We've had an opportunity to question of the administration. Um, are there any further comments or questions? There being none, um, is there a motion to approve the consent to items personnel? So moved. Second. Dr. Luckett has moved. Um, Dr. Sivak has seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any nays? There being none, the motion is approved. Is there a consideration to hold an executive session? Madam President, could I interrupt you one more time and ask Dr. Green another question if I don't forget yes. it? Uh, yes, ma'am. It, it slipped out of my head just that quick. Uh, it may come later, and if not, I'll just ask Mr. Williams and not call him. It's just one you sure? long day. <laughs> okay. Um, you can call me there. too. Oh, okay. <laughs> I can call you and I'll ask you directly. Um, there is, um, there's not a consideration to hold an executive session. So is there um, a motion to adjourn? Oh, I did. I have Oh, well, I'm hold sorry, on. Barbara. I'm so sorry. Excuse me. I appreciate, Dr. Green, you're mentioning our partners, uh, the Kellogg Foundation. I think you mentioned another partner that enabled us to uh, have our new hire start earlier. And, and it's, uh, it's important that we're reminded that we still have partners in this work who are helping us. So thank you for mentioning that. Absolutely. Um, Kellogg, uh, Kellogg Foundation continues to be um, a, a close partner. Um, they've been very responsive and, and um, very much so supportive and encouraging, even as we've tried to figure out our and create our new normal and responding to immediate concerns. They've been very nimble um, uh, for anyone who's worked with foundations before sometimes there's a lot of process because quite often you know there's the accountability and 
We want to make sure that their investments are, are uh, done thoughtfully and all of that. Um, and in times of crisis, you don't always have the time, uh, the luxury of time for a lot of uh, paperwork and, and process and whatnot. You've got to move quickly. And Kellogg Foundation, um, they just continue to, um, to be really strong, thoughtful partners. Uh, right. That's Rhea Bishop, um, Rhea uh, Bishop uh, for her leadership and Todd Clunk, our, our program officer. Great, thank you. Rhea Bishop had an article in the paper Sunday before last, mm -hmm. uh, reaffirming her support. Yep. In Clarion Ledger, yes, Sunday before last. Oh, that's wonderful. Mm-hmm. All right, board members. Is there anything else? Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Dr. Harrison has moved. Ms. Hilliard has seconded. All in favor? Aye. Any nays? There being none, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all for all your hard work. Yep.